In the autumn of 1916, during the First World War, Germany began the construction of a major defense line, the Siegfried Stellung, literally meaning the Siegfried position. This line of defense was known to the British as the Hindenburg Line. At the same time, however, the British and the French were both developing a new weapon, one which could easily breach Germany's line of defense the tank. By 1938, the same name was applied to a new extensive defense, officially the West Wall, which was under construction along Germany's western frontiers. The line of the wall ran approximately from east of Basel to Karlsruhe, west to Luxembourg, and northeast along the borders of Belgium and the Netherlands. Originally intended to defend the re-annexed Saar region in 1936, it was expanded to become the German counterpart to the Allies' Maginot Line. Germany's line of defense became known to the Allies as the Siegfried Line. The original idea of constructing the wall began as early as 1936, when German troops first entered the Rhineland. There was a double line running almost the entire length of the western borders of Germany. On the northern section of this line, there were also the added barriers of the great Ruhr and Maas rivers, and to the south, the Rhine. It was envisaged that these rivers would not stop an advancing army, but they would delay them long enough to allow time for the Germans to bring up mobile reserve forces. Along the frontier were some of Germany's most ancient towns and cities, each of these was also fortified. The roads through these towns would prove to be the weak links in the defenses. Around each town, there were heavy concentrations of dragon's teeth, minefields, and concrete pillboxes. The greatest defense of all, however, was not in the concrete and metal barriers, but in the propaganda myth that surrounded them. According to the Nazis, the West Wall was invincible, even to the tanks which had breached the wall in the First World War. Further inland was a second line of defense, one which incorporated the cities along the widest parts of the Rhine Valley, Cologne, Koblenz, and Karlsruhe. These were also heavily fortified with minefields, tank traps, and pillboxes. 
In May 1938, the great undertaking had commenced. Hitler had ordered that the whole length of Germany's frontier with France, Luxembourg and Belgium should be fortified within 18 months. The man who was given the overall task of supervising construction and the army defense engineers was Dr. Tote, an engineer from an upper-class southern German family. Tote had little contact with politics and the National Socialists, but was well liked by Hitler. Tote and his team set to work immediately, drawing up the plans and schedules for the mammoth task ahead. The job was to be completed within 18 months and Tote was given the authority to call upon all the resources that Germany had to offer. The mighty steelworks of the Ruhr Valley, already running at full capacity to feed Hitler's new war machine, enlisted more men and reopened old plants which had been closed during the Depression. They were going to need to produce over one million tons of steel and iron. Forests were cleared to produce enough timber required to build the wall. Rocks were blasted to produce the three million tons of ballast needed. Five thousand kilometers of heavy steel cable was produced. This was to be used to reinforce the three meter thick concrete structures, making them impregnable. The German state railways were operating at least 100 freight trains every day carrying the materials necessary to feed the inexhaustible construction sites. <laughs> Distribution centers were established along the railway network, where the loads were transferred to trucks to continue the rest of the journey by road. During the period of construction, over one-third of Germany's total production of cement went on building the West Wall. In all, they would need a staggering eight million tons of cement. Tens of thousands of private trucks were commandeered from all over Germany. At the height of construction, over 8,000 truckloads of materials were transported to the sites every single day. 
These trucks were all privately owned, and the owners were paid a pittance for their use. Many operators soon went out of business, only to find that their trucks had subsequently been confiscated. In all, over one million tons of timber would be required to build the wall. This amounted to 708,000 cubic meters of wood. Three million rolls of barbed wire were used. If laid out end to end, this amount of wire would run for 30,000 kilometers. Hundreds of thousands of steel girders were produced. These would be used to support the structures and also to reinforce the concrete fortifications. Despite the massive propaganda advantage, Hitler's wall was regarded by many as the Führer's white elephant. For, they asked themselves, what useful purpose could it serve? Despite this, construction stormed ahead at tremendous expense and with a massive recruitment of labor from all over the Third Reich. From cities all over Germany came a force of skilled labor carpenters, bricklayers, and engineers who were only too glad to have a job again. Or that is how the propaganda went. Tote also had at his disposal huge resources of cheap or even free labor still available in Germany, which was only just barely recovering from the Depression. Tote had amassed a workforce of 100,000 military engineers, 350,000 men from his own outfit known as Organization Tote, and many tens of thousands more from the Nazi labor force. The workforce lived in camps, which had been established all along the remote border areas. Unlike Germany's industrial areas and cities, the frontiers of Germany were scattered with small rural villages where time had stood still for centuries. By the October of 1938, 532,000 men, women, and children were working on the fortification. However, they were not all volunteers. On one day alone in August of 1938, 
12,000 men had been transported from Berlin. To defy the order would have meant, at the best, imprisonment. One contractor in Berlin lost 400 of his finest workers. All of them had been taken to the line, enclosed in lorries, and all of them had been sworn to secrecy or suffer the consequences. Many of the workforce were natives of this remote and depressed borderland of Germany. The young, the old, women and men, all came to work on the line. They were more than happy to supplement their pitiful incomes received from their small holdings and farms, which were still operated in the traditional strip system of the Middle Ages. The West Wall was, in fact, the greatest construction program ever undertaken in Germany's history. Although propaganda constantly reported to the German people how everybody was working together for the ideals of the new Nazi Germany, the truth of the matter was that, in fact, most of the workforce was conscripted or forced labor. Over half of the structure was underground, the thousands of pillboxes being linked by a series of subterranean passageways and tunnels. Work on these was particularly hazardous, and many workers were killed during the four years of construction through cave-ins. The pointed concrete pyramids, or so-called dragon's teeth, varied in height from between one meter and three meters, and were primarily to stop tanks. They were laid throughout the line in rows of five. Towards the end of the construction period in 1939, there was an air of dissatisfaction amongst the laborers. 
they felt they were being treated like convicts, working 15 hours a day with very poor, cramped living conditions and poor food. Guards were drafted in to control the workforce and prevent strikes breaking out. But as the dissatisfaction grew stronger, desperate measures were introduced to improve working conditions and keep the construction on schedule. Anyone who had worked continuously for more than 12 months was allowed leave. Wives were allowed to visit the camps and given cheap railway passes to travel. The wages were increased and to those who worked in the more difficult or dangerous conditions, medals were awarded. These measures, introduced on Hitler's orders to complete the line at all costs, mollified the irate workforce. There were many young workers from the Arbeitsdienst, which was the Nazi labor force. Every able German boy or girl had to join this for six months, as soon as they reached the age of 17, although many volunteered at a much younger age. Their free muscle provided much of the labor for digging the foundations and the anti-tank traps, and also for laying the barbed wire fencing. By the August of 1939, the task was complete. The West Wall was finished. They had completed in just over a year a mammoth construction of concrete, steel, and timber which stretched across the western frontiers of Germany like a gray snake. It was over 640 kilometers long. It reached into Germany along its length some four kilometers in depth. 14,000 pill boxes and bunkers had been constructed, linked by a network of concrete roads. The cost had been a staggering 3.5 billion German marks. Whatever others may have thought about the feasibility or purpose of this new line of fortification, Hitler had his own opinion, and it was all part of his grand plan. He knew that it would give him the complete freedom of action in the East that he needed for his intended actions in Poland and Czechoslovakia. For the first time in history, due to the protection the wall offered in the West, Germany did not have to fear a war on two fronts. The reason for her military downfall so often in the past Hitler had once remarked to one of his generals, believe me, general, I am the greatest builder of fortifications of all time. I built the West Wall. In Britain and America, this new gray concrete wall that had suddenly appeared so startlingly across the center of Europe was thought so amusing that it was dubbed the Siegfried Line. It became the subject of a song and was one of the musical hits of 1939. We're gonna hang out the washing on the Siegfried Line. Have you any dirty washing, Mother dear? We're gonna hang out the washing on the Siegfried Line, cause the washing day is here. For a long time afterwards, 
first the British and then the American soldiers going off to war would sing the lines of the song about how they would be hanging out their washing on the Siegfried line. If the Siegfried line's still there. However, it was, and in fact still is. Ironically, tragically, over 100,000 of those young soldiers, British, French, Canadian and American, marching gaily to war with that song on their lips, were fated to die before its steel and concrete bunkers. A similar number of young German soldiers would suffer the same fate defending it. Each bunker was about seven meters wide and six meters high, with the walls and roof up to three meters thick. Each bunker would house a garrison of 14 men. The fortifications were typically Germanic, hard, lean, and spartan. The wall was ready, like a snake, waiting to catch its prey. And when it did, its bite would be deadly. Following his attack on Poland and his failed peace attempts with the West, the wall gave Hitler time to plan his assault westward. By 1940, however, he no longer had a need for the wall. He was now master of Western Europe. The wall was abandoned, its bunkers locked. By the beginning of 1944, the Germans knew that an invasion was inevitable and they looked to the defenses of the West Wall to prevent the Allies from entering Germany. By the summer of 1944, the south of Britain was crammed with men and equipment. America had dispatched almost 950,000 troops, as well as vast amounts of trucks, armored cars, tanks, and supplies. The roads of Kent were full of trucks, end to end an endless convoy of men and machinery. This was to be the start of the greatest amphibious operation ever undertaken in the history of warfare. 5,000 ships, together with thousands of smaller craft backed by 1,100 aircraft, were about to hurl almost 200,000 men against Hitler's Atlantic Wall, behind which Field Marshal von Rundstedt's 60 divisions were lying in wait. Once the beaches of Normandy had been breached, Operation Overlord called for an army of almost two million British, American and Commonwealth troops to advance inland across Europe. The objective? Nothing less than the liberation of Europe and the defeat of Nazi Germany. The assault was finally launched on the 6th of June, 1944, a day that would be forever known to the Allies as D-Day. The days following the invasion became a fierce battle between the Allies trying to secure their beachhead and the Germans preventing them from doing so. More troops were being ferried across the channel and the advance continued inland through Normandy. The US Third Army was unleashed into Brittany and then south towards the River Loire. At the same time, the US First Army was advancing towards the town of Vire with the British Second Army launching an assault on Villers-Bocage. The German resistance was fierce, and they launched counter-attack after counter-attack. Hitler was adamant 
that there should be no withdrawal from Normandy, and ordered his generals to keep the Allies contained. By the end of July, the Allies' assault was gathering momentum, nearly two million men had been landed, and town after town was falling from Nazi hands. Piece by piece, France was being liberated by the Allies, and Hitler's armies were being forced into withdrawal. As the Allies' advance gathered strength, the Germans had little choice other than to retreat, or risk being encircled and the traps being set for them. Throughout France, there was a joyous cry. After almost five long years under the horrors of Nazi occupation, the Allies were finally coming. By the 25th of August, two and a half months after the launch of the assault on Fortress Europe, the Allies were entering Paris. Although most of the German garrison had withdrawn, there were still pockets of resistance. Snipers holed up in buildings were forced to surrender or face the consequences. As the columns of US troops made their triumphant entry, the city was saturated with joyous and emotional Parisians. For the first time in almost five years, they were free once again. On the 3rd of September, it was the turn of Brussels to be liberated. This time, it was by courtesy of the British Guards' armoured division. The Germans were now retreating back into their own homeland, and the gap was closing up on the German border. If Germany was to remain in Nazi hands, the Siegfried Line would be the final frontier. However, the Allies did have a problem. Supplies were not reaching the frontline troops. The supply columns could not keep pace with the advance, and they were rapidly running out of food, fuel, and ammunition. By mid-September, the Allies were approaching Western Wall defenses between Aachen and Geilen Kirchen. The Siegfried Line was holding. The heavily fortified pillboxes, spaced at a distance of about 150 meters apart, seemed impregnable. The next phase of the operation was hatched. If the Allies could not breach the Siegfried Line, then the plan was to go around it in the north. 
three airborne divisions would seize the bridges at Eindhoven, Grave, Nijmegen, and across the Rhine at Arnhem. A further division of ground troops would link up with the airborne forces to support them once the bridges had been taken. The first two assaults at Grave and Eindhoven were successful. The third managed to secure one side of the bridge at Arnhem, but there was a fierce resistance. The British Airborne Division, with over 10,000 men, clung on desperately to the northern approach, but they were unable to dislodge the Germans from the southern end. The road bridge remained intact, but the Germans had destroyed the rail bridge. Two panzer divisions made it impossible for the Allied reinforcements to reach the British, and they were soon pinned down. Hampered by poor wireless communications and bad weather that delayed the dropping of supplies by air, the airborne division was beginning to succumb to the German counterattacks. On the 25th of September, short of ammunition and knowing that by now reinforcements were too far away to help, the British were ordered to break out and try to reach Allied lines. Of more than 10,300 men engaged at Arnhem, only 2,827 managed to reach safety. By the beginning of October 1944, the Allies were closing in on Aachen. Aachen was defended by three Falks Grenadier and Infantry Divisions under the command of General der Infanterie Friedrich Kochling. Though these troops had not as yet engaged in any major action, they had been decisively weakened in the desperate efforts to stem the Allies breaking through the Siegfried Line. On October the 7th, the Allies were attacking six miles north of the city, attempting to encircle Aachen and attack it from the rear. To the defenders, attempting to preserve Aachen as a citadel of Nazi ideology seemed bleak. Even so, the Germans did try to counterattack, attempting to hold off the Allies' advance long enough for von Rundstedt's panzer divisions to be brought in from reserves. This, however, would never happen. The German high command had already conceded that Aachen would inevitably be lost and would therefore not risk losing their valuable panzer divisions. The Allies pressed southwards towards Versoulen, some five kilometers from Aachen. The Western Wall was beginning to show signs of crumbling. By the 10th of October, the Allies were concentrating on the hills overlooking Aachen. The Germans were by now being pressed on two fronts, and the Allies' net was tightening around the city. An ultimatum was sent to the commander of the German garrison. 
If he failed to capitulate unconditionally within 24 hours, the ultimatum warned, the Americans would pulverize the city with artillery and bombs and then seize the remaining rubble by ground assault. The 24 hours came and went, and the final assault was launched on the city. The industrial suburb of Haaren on the outskirts of that city was first to crumble. To the north of the city, the US 30th Division was also closing in. The fighting around the outskirts of the city went on seemingly endlessly. As the Germans fought ferociously for every meter the Allies gained. Meanwhile, the British 21st Armoured Group under Field Marshal Montgomery were advancing on Antwerp further north open farmland, easily crossed by tanks, gave way to impenetrable forests and high commanding hills. German defenses were strong, and the German soldier, fighting for his fatherland, was a disciplined and formidable opponent. Allied casualties were mounting heavily. After a long, five-week siege of Arpen, the US troops finally moved in on the 13th of October, sweeping towards the center through a maze of rubble and damaged buildings. The city had been the victim not only of the Allied assault, but also months of aerial bombing campaigns by the Royal Air Force. Of the 165,000 pre-war inhabitants, a meager 20,000 remained. German snipers holed up in sewers or cellars were flushed out. On the other half of the attack across the city, the American troops were blocked initially by heavily defended blocks of flats. The soldiers measured their gains in buildings, floors, and even rooms. Some said that the fight was from attic to attic and sewer to sewer. Germans sheltered and hid in all manner of buildings, offices, and private dwellings from which they launched attacks on the rear of the US soldiers as they passed by. The city had to be searched comprehensively and thoroughly. No building was left untouched. On October the 19th, Oberst Wilk, commanding what was left of the remaining German troops, issued his orders. 
The defenders of Aachen will prepare for their last battle. Constricted to the smallest possible space, we shall fight on to the last man, the last shell, and the last bullet, in accordance with the Führer's orders. In the face of the contemptible, despicable treason committed by certain individuals, I expect each and every defender of the venerable imperial city of Aachen to do his duty to the end. In fulfillment of our oaths to the flag, I expect courage and determination to hold out. Long live the Führer and our beloved fatherland. The defenders of Aachen had been abandoned and left to their fate. They finally surrendered on the 21st of October. Further north, the British fought hard and began to attack east of the Maas River. The next phase was the push towards the Rhine. Germany was by now defending her borders on all fronts. A mighty Siegfried Line or Western Wall, Germany's last defense, had broken. All that remained were piles of rubble and the shattered remains of the pillboxes. The Allies were now on German soil and Nazi Germany's final days were numbered. Along the Siegfried Line, Allied troops were hoisting flags and clearing the path for the final assault on Fortress Germany. The British Prime Minister Winston Churchill flew to the line to see it for himself. He had known that the risks and responsibility of launching so many men in one assault were enormous. Much could have gone wrong between those months of June to October, and no one knew better than he. For 29 years earlier in the First World War, thousands of British and Empire soldiers had perished under machine gun fire as they sought to land on the beaches of Gallipoli. As First Lord of the Admiralty at that time, he had borne the responsibility of the losses and much of the blame. General Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force for the invasion of Normandy, also viewed the breached wall in the winter of 1944. Driven by his ruthless leadership, the Allies had raced across France to reach the German border. The speed of its advance kept the Germans always off balance. He had been the advocate of attacking Germany on a broad front, a tactic which had paid off. By December the 13th, the city of Metz had fallen. Eisenhower then ordered his troops, in a bold diversion, to strike at the German southern flank and advance on the Rhine, 
On March the 22nd, 1945, after a long and murderous winter, the Allies finally crossed the Rhine. A gigantic vice was now closing on the Third Reich. This river was the last major natural obstacle between the Allies and Germany's heartland. Once across, the armies would fan swiftly over Hitler's crumbling Reich and encircle its industrial heart, the Ruhr Valley. Hitler had promised the German people invincibility. He had promised that the Third Reich would last for a thousand years. It lasted barely 12. Hitler's Reich left hardly anything tangible in its wake, apart from the geographical and political consequences of the most terrible war in history. With one exception, a lasting monument in concrete and steel, which still stands today. The West Wall had held the Allied armies and prolonged the war for seven months. It was finally breached under the sheer weight of numbers. The cost in Allied dead to breach the wall was higher than that suffered in the Korean and Vietnam wars combined. Where Hitler and his generals once walked to a mighty rapture from the people of Germany, there were now only the victorious footsteps of an army which had brought down the final curtain on an earth-shaking drama. <laughs> 